is the second episode of this special show, and tonight we have a wonderful guest. It's going to be internal alchemy in the first hour, and then more of a regular off-planet radio section segment in the second hour, because our guest tonight is a jack-of-all-trades. Uh, he is a, uh, an expert on gut health, and he's come to his knowledge based on his own personal health crises, and unfortunately, it's some tragedies that he's experienced in his own life, so he's here to, to sort of you know, connect for us how, you know, your own personal experiences lead you to finding health and wellness. And later we'll wrap it all around in the second hour, how that leads you to coming to truth about what's going on in this world. And you find yourself researching uh, the CNP and the Finders Cult. <laughs> anyway, John Briston, finally, welcome to Off Planet Radio Internal Alchemy. Thank you for having me, Emily. Absolutely. So you've been around a little bit in the alternative media the last couple of years actually i don't think you get as much attention as you should i think your work is really good and you're an appealing appealing uh, guest um you know, you're nice to listen to um so for the people who haven't heard you before can you give us a little bit of your background on what your own health crisis your own traumatic birth story and what kind of brought you to this and then and then with your son and what kind of brought you to the space where you do what you do Yes, Emily. So I was born three and a half premature months premature back in three, three and a half months. I was supposed to be born in December, I was, but I was born in September um, back in 1985, which was m very major back then. Uh, there wasn't actually a needle nail unit in the, in the city that I live in Fayetteville. Um, so they had to transport my mother by ambulance up to UNC Chapel Hill at that time. Um, so, of course, I wasn't expected to live. My mother had systemic lupus. Uh, they actually told her to abort me. Uh, when I was a child because they didn't know the complications that she was going to have during pregnancy or the complications that would have been given to me uh, that, you know, lupus was kind of new at that time and is trying to try to figure out as an autoimmune condition. Um, so, but she, uh, she was a staunch Catholic, so she refused and my father always wanted a child. Uh, so I was born, I was born dead. Uh, they had to revive me. They gave me a less than 1% chance of surviving yet here or here I am. Um, they studied me for about a year at the University of Chapel Hill thinking that I was going to be mentally handicapped. Uh, be, be because of the premature state that I was in, but neither mental handicap or physical handicap, thank God, did not happen to me. Um, and then later, I developed asthma and allergies as a child. Very, it was very strong, very severe asthma, probably from undeveloped lungs, um, for being premature. Um, and uh, my mother died uh, when I was around the age of six or seven due to complications of systemic lupus. She caught bronchitis. Um, and ended up passing away in her sleep um, from uh, bronchitis that she had. Um, and uh, so throughout my childhood, I was very sickly. Uh, my appendix burst. Um, I was about the age of 14. I was, um, and uh, after that, I had actually had a, I lost 80 pounds. I went from 180 pounds down to about 195, 100 pounds. I spent a month in the hospital. They had to cut me open, Emily. They had to take out my organs, do a peritoneal wash where they had to clean my intestinal organs. So I went a week. My appendix burst, and I went a week before they had I had gotten to take out. I should have died from that. Um, I mean, I looked like a concentration camp victim afterwards. I was extremely pale, white skin. I mean, I looked horrible. So they, I ended up having an abdominal hernia. They had to go back in and fix that. And, you know, I had, I was okay for a while and, and everything. And it was about the, when my first son was born around that time, back in 2009, I think it was, it was right before the month before, it was about September. I ate at a, a fish fry at my grandmother-in-law's house and the water bus had been contaminated with H. pylori because I, 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 my stomach started burning really bad for the first time in my life. Even all the issues I ever had, I never had gastritis. I didn't even know what gastritis was. It felt like I had swallowed a, a a charcoal, you know, like a, a lit coal. And that's when everything started. I started, uh, silent reflux and celiac disease showed up and, 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 and just really bad digestive issues and, and constipation and then everything that, even though I had health issues previously, I always thought I had an iron gut, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I could eat whatever I want. And that turned out not to be the case. So for years I went to doctors trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. Uh, what had caused my problems initially, none of them could give me any answers. I was taking my Cinepril at a time, which is an ACE inhibitor uh, for borderline blood pressure because I was overweight at the time. And uh, I, um, I, I didn't know that it depleted zinc. It reduced my testosterone. It killed my immune system. That's probably why I got the H. pylori dysbiosis in the first place. Um, and so after years of researching and reading, and, and I remember um, – a couple of things. This guy, I guess, ties into my conspiracy research. 
Um, I remember hearing Dr. Joel Wallach on InfoWars, had been back in 2008 on Coast to Coast AM right before I'd gotten sick. And he started saying some things about health and everything, and Alex Jones started talking about 9-11. And I, I, I'd always been, a, you know, I raised in conventional medicine. My grandfather was a pharmacist. I thought alternative medicine was a bunch of bull. Um, and I thought, you know, conventional medicine had saved me these so many times throughout my life. And and, uh, and everything, and even though my dad later passed away when I was 18 because of hepatitis, he was actually one of the first people in the United States diagnosed with FC, and actually was one of the first people who took Robovirin uh, from Duke University during the mid-90s uh, for it. Um, and I still had faith in conventional medicine at that time, but when I got sick myself and no doctor could give me answers, and they all thought I was crazy and everything, I started doing the research on my own. That's when I started finding out that there were flaws in the normal thinking of conventional medicine, not to say that conventional medicine doesn't have a place for trauma, for necessary surgeries, not unnecessary surgeries, and for diagnostic medicine when done correctly, conventional medicine does have its place. However, alternative medicine does very well in cancer, heart disease, diabetes, chronic, you know, immune conditions like lupus and, and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease more than conventional medicine has is a track record of more of just covering up the symptoms and not addressing the root causes for those such diseases. Um, so after that, I, my son, my middle child, Abel, he was born with a very rare medical condition called congenital myopathy with excess muscle spindles. He was six diagnosed in the world with it at that time. It was extremely rare. Um, he, he, um, my wife knew there was, we knew there were some complications when she was pregnant with him. She had polyhydramos. She had, was carrying too much amniotic fluid, um, as well as he wasn't really moving very much in the ultrasound that we'd gotten around the 30 second week. So they decided to do a ces emergency cesarean section. Uh, when they took him out, he was very, um, he didn't even cry. He couldn't physically uh, cry. Um, his hands were contractured. He's very physically disabled. Um, and we had no idea what was going on. Uh, they took him to the, the NICU, the neonatal unit. Um, they rushed him there. They stabilized him. They put him on a ventilator. And uh, the uh, head of the neonatal unit uh, for Cape Valley at that time came to us. He said some very harsh words, saying pretty much it would have been better if Abel had passed away in the womb, uh, that he was going to pass away very shortly, and there's probably nothing that they could do for him. They would try to stabilize him, maybe transport him to UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, and in Raleigh to see if there's something that maybe they could be, be, maybe be done there. They had no idea what was going on with him. Uh, so they transferred him up to UNC, and they, they started trying to do diagnostic procedures to try to find out what's wrong with him. They did a muscle biopsy. Uh, they sent it to the Mayo Clinic, and one doctor, one doctor, I mean, the whole team reviewed it, and he was, I think he was like 65, 66, somewhere around that. He goes, I've seen one case. One case like this, and it was an HRSG mutation uh, uh, disease similar to his known as a Costello syndrome. And he was like, I think this is kind of like it because he has more muscle spindles than muscle fibers. Muscle fibers is what gives your muscles strength. Muscle spindles are what tell your brain the location of your muscles. So right now my brain knows that my arm is behind me. So he had more muscle spindles than he did fibers. So he had lack of muscle, like he, he couldn't hold his arm up very well, okay? Mm -hmm. So they said it's going to progressively going to get worse. There's nothing we could do at all, and he's going to die. So I did all the research I could, and for what I've seen, it seemed to be right in the state that he was in. I mean, he had been on the ventilator now for about six months. And I was like, look, we could try some things, but I don't know. I was a lot less in the knowledge range that I know now, and I had my doubts. So my wife and I talked about it, and I was like, look, I don't want him to suffer for the rest of his life if he's going to die, and it looks like that's going to, going to happen. So we made the decision, as difficult as it was, and a decision I regret to this day, to take him off the ventilator and let him die in peace. We were going to take him up to the, to the, the top of the hospital, uh, and we were going to hold him in the garden up there and let him die. Um, but that wasn't God's will for that to happen. Uh, while we were making that decision, he spit out the in in incubation tube, the breathing tube, which he was not supposed to be able to do. Like I said, for six months, his lungs should have atrophied further. His, his throat muscle should have atrophied further from not swallowing, from being fed through a G-tube. Uh, but he did it. It was a miracle. There's no explanation other outside of that. Um, so uh, he was breathing better on his self. He's breathing better by himself off the ventilator than on. So they said, okay, you could take him home. He's probably still going to die. 
um, but we're going to put him in hospice care. So I said, okay. So we took him home. So by then I was like, look, I'm done with this. I want to dig everything I could find. And it wasn't hardly any literature on what to do. Maybe there's something I could do. So I started talking with this neurogeneticist and I actually won her over. She was at first uh, Dr. Fan, who's an excellent doctor. She a dual doctor. She's Chinese, very brilliant woman. Said there's nothing we could do at first, but later she became as strong as advocate for what she saw that I was able to do for him. Mm -hmm. So I started researching uh, ways to overcome cardiomyopathy, and that led me to my mitochondrial research and how you know mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. If you seem to improve their health, of course, the heart as a muscle has tons of mitochondria in them, and if you can improve mitochondrial health and mitochondrial function, the heart should function better. And there's cases of you know uh, of heart failure patients taking Hawthorne Berry and ubiquinol and and PQQ and magnesium and, and their and, and their ejection fractions or how you know the force of how well their heart is able to beat increases to the point where some of them were able to get off oxygen. So I was like, well, if I do that with him, maybe he'll get better. So I convinced him, you know, Dr. Fan to write a prescription so that the nurses could give it to him. So they started giving him 100 milligrams of ubiquinol, liquid of ubiquinol a day, uh, magnesium. And I started giving, you know, take him outside, get him sunlight as much as possible and grounding in ways that I could to activate uh, his, his parasympathetic nervous system, as well as to help try to increase mitochondrial output and mitochondrial biogenesis. Well, it worked. He started getting better. He uh, started mo moving very well. He, his blood pressure went to normal. The, cardio, uh, the cardiologists, were, they couldn't understand it. Emily. They, they, couldn't, they were like, well, his, he should have, have cardio. His heart, his heart should be weakening. How is it stronger? Almost to the point where it's as strong as a normal child. Um, so we were feeding him, and I started putting him on a, a natural formula because, as you know, a lot of baby formulas, even a lot of like G2 formulas, are full of crap. Yeah. GMs, crappy Soy fats sugar, like canola yeah. oil, yep, all that stuff. Yeah. So I started making a homemade formula, and he, so he was never really supposed to gain a lot of weight because they're afraid of his heart. And they also he had pectus excavatum, where his, his chest wall kind of caked in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So they didn't want him to gain a lot of weight because they're afraid it was going to affect his heart. Well, the nutritionist there, I don't know what got up with her, and I'm not going to give her name, but she, I really. She started saying that we weren't feeding him, and that's why he wasn't gaining enough weight. He was a lower percentile and started making accusations that if we didn't start feeding him the formula that they prescribed and the set amounts and stuff like that, that she was going to contact Child Protective Services and then the hospital social worker got involved. Now, I was younger. If, now, if it was me, you know, with my age, about a good 10 or so years, I would have told them to screw off, all right? But I was scared. You know, they were pressuring me. I didn't want them to take away my boy. You know, so I said, fine, fine. I capitulated. Well, all right. Well, you know, whatever. Well, he started aspirating because they were giving him too much of the formula and he couldn't digest it. It just didn't work well for him. So he was, that started a long nightmare of him being in and out of the hospital for about six months with him being intubated again with another breathing tube, with him almost dying from not breathing from, from, a, from a vent of aspiration. And they still always, I kept telling them, Emily, it was aspiration. I know it's aspiration because when he goes to the hospital, he eats less food, they, they, they restrict his food, and he goes back to healing, goes back to being normal. But they kept wanting to say it was his condition getting worse. And I knew it wasn't that. So eventually I was able to convince him that that wasn't the case. Again, we took him home, put him back on the homemade formula because by that time the doctors were with me, his pulmonologist was with me. They didn't care what the nutritionist said. He started coming back. He was actually at the point where we were going to take the ventilator off the next month. He was going to get a passing mirror in, or he was going to be able to start talking. Well, sadly, because of the complications of the intubation and all the damage and trauma that had been done to his lungs, he had a free pulmonary embolism, and, and he died. And how old was he when he died? Almost three. Oh, oh so you, you really kept him going for a good bit of time there. Yes, he lived longer than any of the other children in reported medical literature who all passed away from cardiomyopathy before the age of two. Can I ask, what? so your health issues really start, I mean, you've had health issues your whole life, yes. um, and, but you started to have a different awareness about them after you had this issue with the food poisoning or the H. pylori, it, it, yes. which I know is a focus of a lot of your work and we'll get into in a little bit. But 
before this all happened, before you had that issue, that issue with your with your health, and before this happened with your son, what was your profession? Were you already a nutritional consultant, or was this something you totally had to do on the fly to try and save your kid, to save yourself, and then to save your kid? It was totally to save myself and save my kid. I'd originally, uh, before my father had passed away, I'd had a full paid scholarship to the University of Charlotte for computer programming. Uh, that's originally what I was going to do with my life, but. I had a mental breakdown because I lost my father. I came back home. That's when I met my wife. She was a long-term childhood friend and we'd fallen out of touch and recently had moved back. We had got together and I ended up holding odd jobs and went back to some community college thinking about being a nurse off and on. Um, you know, worked at the local auto parts place and everything and just hold odd jobs until I had gotten sick. Um, and then that's when I was like, well, I'm going to have to learn this because no one else is helping me. You know, yeah. so I became an autodidact and just read everything I could get a hold of. Um, and I guess how Fix Your Gut started, I guess I should mention that too, is, is I used, do you know who Dave Asprey is? Yep. Okay. I used to, uh, I, I, for, first time, I remember Abel's in the hospital. I can, everybody can remember the first time they heard as much as I despise Joe Rogan now. Mm -hmm. Hearing yep. uh, Dave Asprey on Joe Rogan the first time. Yeah, that was, was, it was great. I remember, yes. I, I, I watched it too, Yeah. Yeah, and I, so I was walking, you know, I was at the hospital, you know, I was at USC Chapel Hall, and I was walking back to the Ronald McDonald House, and I was listening to that first episode. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I remember going weird. home, and I remember going home after hearing that, and printing out the little map he has, you know, the little yep. bread he has of the food. Me too. So that's funny that we both kind of got inspired by that. That's interesting, yeah. And that's what set this all off. So I joined the Bulletproof Forums, I started talking with like-minded like individuals, how I met my friend Jason Hooper, who's a partner of Fix Your Gut, who does the podcasting with me and everything like that. I helped him with some health issues that he had. He almost died from taking the wrong probiotic and having to have gastrointestinal surgery because of that. He's talked about that on our own podcast. And I also met my other friend who's also the, another founder, uh, Titus, whose, whose sister has a Cardi syndrome where she's not born with a corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. and she has many brain uh, deformities and she has constant seizure disorders. Mm -hmm. But the doctors told her that she's so severely mentally handicapped that they don't even know if there's a person in there. Mm -hmm. um, I told him it has to be because of the seizure activity that she, you know, that, that, that they used to cut the corpus callosum uh, for both seizure disorders and, and everything. And the two hemispheres of the brain can still communicate without the corpus callosum. So I was like, you know, if we stop the seizures, she'll get better. And she, she has, you know, with CBD oil, with magnesium. And, and I mean, she's outlived, outlived many, many children with Icardi syndrome. Um, wow. But she's actually showing emotion. Uh, reaction, like to her yeah. parents, like smiling and, and, and knowing that it's her mother and stuff that they said would never happen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, because of the seizure disorder, I think there's a little tra trapped little girl, you know, yeah. she's trapped. Um, but it, it, well, working on that, she has greatly improved. I don't know if she'll ever have complete cognition, but at least as she, I, she's able to emote and able to react and able to, to babble. Um, you know, and they gave her up on her, you know, like they gave yeah. up on my son, you know, to, to the medical establishment, those people who deserve our most care, um, but by no fault of their own, there's no fault that she was born that way. There's no fault that my, you know, that, that my son was born that way. Um, the, the medical establishment kind of looks at him at, at a eugenics level of just being a waste yeah. of space. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's very sad in that regard. They also look at the elderly that way too. Um, so, but yeah, that's how we started Fix Your Gut and everything. What came with it was just because we all got together and I just, with all the knowledge, they were like, hey, why don't you help people? And so I wrote Fix Your Gut and, you know, put 250 blog articles for free on my website and I'm still writing them and a YouTube channel and everything. If anybody's sick that's out there, write to me at johnfixyourgut.com. If you need a free book, you know, and you can't afford it, I'll send it to you. I've given away, you know, thousands of copies. I don't mind doing that at all. Um, I know what it is to be ill. I know what it is to have family members who are ill, Emily. I mean, yeah. I don't want anybody to be sick if I, if I can help it. So so it's really interesting you, that all three of you came together based on yours or a family member's own health crises. In yes. fact, most, all of the people um, – so I came to working in health and nutrition from – not anywhere near as severe as a health crisis as you or your son had, but my own as a person who had been extremely healthy and a high level athlete for most of, most of my life, I was in a space where I could barely get out of my bed and, you know, having all, all the issues that go along with basically a candida infection, but for years and years and not knowing 
you know, what it was. And the person who really helped me and motivated me to be doing what I'm doing also had to, she had MS and she had to figure it out on her own because they told her you're going to be in a wheelchair and get ready for that. And, you know, so it's very interesting how like basically the victims have to end up not only becoming their own best self advocate, but are then for able to help people more than these doctors with the white coats and the big salaries and all the respect. Uh, it's, both an inspiring story and a sad reality. It's just that sad story about the reality, you know, that 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 we live in. Um, just quick, a couple things came up as I was listening to you. Yes. Um, have you? I listened to you a little bit on Nox Mente today as I was getting ready for this. And um, Jerry and Nick are good friends. They've been on the show. Yes, a Jerry's times. a good friend of mine too, as well. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't I haven't talked to him in a while, but um, I so I was listening to you and their interview style is great and really insightful, but. I, all I could think the whole time was, first of all, is, uh, you actually, you and I actually have quite a bit in common, and as you do with a lot of people who are in our community, I don't know how much you've seen of Off Planet Radio, but uh, Randy basically started it initially as um, a show that was about supernatural experiences, yes. alien UFO abductions, and what he kept finding at the end of every story was the military abductions and mind control. Right. And, 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 MK, and so he then kind of shifted to a really more down the MK ultra kind of route with the show, which is how I found him and how I became involved with all of this. Um, listening to you talk, it sounds like, I and mean, have you considered that that could have been something for you? Because listening to you talk uh, about your, all of your, several of you in your family seem to have become members of studies at the UNC Chapel Hill, right? And, and we know that they run these kinds of studies yes. programs simultaneously. Um, and then some of the, both, some of the things I heard you talking about on Knox Mente, and I recommend people go listen to that interview because it's very good, sort of supernatural kinds of things, which are part of that, but also that your father was a drug addict. Right. Yes. And also, and was, was the first to receive certain drugs. Have you considered that your family could be long-term test subjects or that you may have be part of some sort of mind control or genetic programming kind of thing? I mean, have you gone there with yourself? Yes, I have. I'm not going to, okay. I'm not going to hold back and say that I have it. Um, yeah. I mean, I find it very weird. Like I said that, you know, I, when I try to ask my grandfather, cause my father's, yeah, I can't ask him, but I try to ask my grandpa. I was like, look, how, what was going on in USC Chapel Hill? Like, even I have thought that, like, what were they doing, you know? And, and he would kind of be like, well, you know, the doctors would analyze you and they'd be behind a room and, and we weren't there and, and everything. And, and I was like, okay, well, that's, that's, all, that's a little odd, um, you know? And they, they would talk about how, you know, he, he didn't really know much that was going on. And I tried to ask my uncle and it was the same thing. And I tried to get my medical records and I, I couldn't really get a hold of them. And I thought that was odd. And I tried to do that when my son was up there in USC Chapel Hill because I was just curious. I was like, well, I kind of want to know about that time period of my life, you know, and I, and I tried to get a hold of them and they were just saying, well, you know, they, they were a long time ago, they were paper records and we just don't have them, you know, and I was like, okay, well, that's a lot, I, I guess. I mean, it's, UNC Chapel is a major hospital, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in North Carolina. It's not like, you know, the local Cape Fear Valley where I live in Fayetteville. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, my dad was very conspiracy minded. Okay. And this is one of my biggest regrets. To, and I, I want to, you know, when I was meet my father and get into heaven, I want to let him know. I want to tell him, I'm like, look, sorry, I didn't believe you. I mean, I remember growing up listening to Coast to Coast AM with him, watching the X Files with him. I found an old grammar uh, book that my grandpa had after he had passed away back in December. Um, that was my father's back when he was in uh, late high school, early college. We actually wrote CI OSS equals CIA. Mm -hmm. Our CIA equals OSS. He put it in, in reverse. But, and so, you know, I, I want to go back and I want to tell him. So there were times where my dad, I remember growing up terrified of being abducted by aliens, just te flat out terrified of it. <laughs> and there were times where my dad, you know, said the aliens had, had came over, um, the, the mobile home that we had lived in uh, and, and everything. And there was a time period where my dad and I had been after my, my mom had passed away. We were driving back from Lumberton uh, at the hospital that was there. And I remember one time we pulled off the side of the road and we saw something that was up in the sky. And I kind of just remember like missing time and stuff that I don't remember anything else other than that. So if you ask me if I've contemplated of whether or not I have been experimented upon or abducted, I, 
yes, I have. Now, I can't substantiate any of that stuff, mm-hmm. and I like to be logic. I have intuition. I have strong intuition, but I like to be logically minded. I don't have any evidence of that outside of those weird occurrences, but I will right. say, yes, I do think about it quite often. Yeah, so, I mean, they're not going to show up uh, on your door and knock and say, here's your file, yeah. sir, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's kind of like we're left to our own devices, but one of the – benefits of this great surveillance tool they have of us called the internet is that we've also yes. been able to compare stories with each other you know and do you mind telling me I, I, you mentioned a little bit that your dad had maybe had been a heroin addict was yeah. that the only drug he what drugs was he was he doing oh uh, uh, okay that was back in the 60s and 70s and later he did do oxycontin once his liver was fake well I'll, I'll get to that but yeah yes during that time period uh my father was a hippie uh, mm-hmm. And he did do psychedelics mm-hmm. as well as he did uh, he did do heroin. Um, he had his first overdose. He almost died. He got clean. Uh, he became a Christian, mm-hmm. um, and um, and then later he relapsed when because of the Sackler family and Purdue Pharmaceutical because mm-hmm. he was in pain because of cirrhosis of the liver, and they told him that oxycotton was not happy for him. Yeah. So one of the things, and we can talk about this a little bit later as we get into some of the nutrition talk that, you know, I had this whole revelation around the idea uh, a couple years ago about the idea, I, this idea that sugar is programmable matter. And yes. I got that my, I got that from some information about vaping originally, but even before that, this I think a lot of these drugs that are synthetic are actually programmed drugs. Whereas when they started MK ultra like stuff back in the fifties or sixties, they were giving people drugs and then programming them. Right. Yes. And it got to a point where a lot of the drugs nowadays are more synthetic in nature and the programming is actually in the drugs. Yes. Right. Okay. Does that make, I've I've heard, I've heard you talk about that before and I wanted to say that I percent agree with you. Yeah. So, um, so I, you know, sometimes we don't, we are not given evidence, but I have, for me, I've actually found some interesting familial connections that I haven't really talked about much on the air yet, and I will at some point, but it is interesting to, to look and find out that sometimes our parents, by whether they know it or not, are actually involved through their jobs or through their social interactions in the programs that then we'll get pulled into in, in a different way as we're coming up. And it sounds like, you know, your mother lupus was a new thing when she had it. They had, you were, you know, it was rare what happened with you as a kid. And lupus is one of those, it's another one of those illnesses. that's very odd. It's another one of those autoimmune uh, issues that is, is bizarre. And yes. uh, it, lupus actually means wolf in Latin, I believe is the name of it, right? And I don't know if you've ever heard, he's a past guest on this program many, many years ago, um, but there's a, a guy named White Wolf Van again who talks about wolf programming with mind control and MK Ultra. It's also something that I've talked about with Nish and with some other people and whatnot, but there is some, uh, there is there is a wolf style programming that goes along. And I've always wondered if lupus, because you see that sometimes people who've been through programming end up with these autoimmune diseases, they end up with, Lyme's disease, they end up with lupus, they end up with fibromyalgia, MS, things like that, right? And and later, as part of their healing from whatever their disease is, they also come to find, they also start to become conspiracy theorists, or this kind of stuff starts to happen with it. It's almost like once the body heals, there's information stored somewhere inside of that illness that is part of a program that will reveal itself to you as you heal yourself. And I've always, does that make sense? Yeah, but I would also argue, too, it's the trauma that a person goes through through a chronic disease in and of itself, and when they go search for answers, that more than likely they go search for the truth. Yes, I agree. Yes. That is what what But what you're saying, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you on that at all, and I would say that there are many people, whether it's through uh, uh, trauma that is done to them as a child who d- later developed autoimmune conditions. For example, my mother grew up in a very abusive household uh, by, by, by uh, my, my grandmother-in-law, um, and, and a lot of trauma was inflicted on her uh, from that, which, you know, would eventually lead to, uh, her, you know, her, her immune system not functioning well, and, and, and which would eventually lead to lupus, which I do believe, through my own research with the butterfly rash and everything, seems to be uh, both candida and staph dysbiosis. Uh-huh. Uh, seems to be the main trigger for the butterfly rash is very, very, uh, very similar to, to, to a staph type rash. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there are some studies to, to prove that, not as much as other immune conditions like MS being strongly, strongly linked to H. pylori and being strongly linked to Epstein-Barr and other uh, herpes veridae viruses. Oh, but um, also linked to candida. I mean, that yes. was, yeah. The, 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 interesting though, it's called a butterfly rash, right? We find all these funny yep. word connections, right? Like monarch programming and this kind of stuff. It's like, how is, like, either we're living in a simulation or there's something funny going on here, either, you know what I mean? But, you know, so, yes, but I, I, do you think lupus is a, also like a created disease like Lyme disease? Do you think all of these autoimmune diseases are, are created diseases or do you think they're just a uh, happenstance, like the uh, unfortunate sort of like byproducts of some of these other things that you've talked about? There's some proof that we know that lupus, not lupus, uh, a Borrelia, the specific Borrelia strain that runs off, because both bacteria, they require iron for metabolism. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But the one specifically with Lyme disease, um, that causes chronic Lyme, a specific uh, subspecies of Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, and I'm butchering the second part of the nomenclature, um, seems to use manganese as a transport. And there has been, and I've talked about it on THC, but it seems to be a strong connection between it being developed at Plum Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the same with, with uh, West Nile virus, too, that also, for some imagine, out of all the places it manages to show up in New York City, right. anywhere else in the United States it could have showed up, it just happened to show up there. Um, so there are some diseases, yes, that I do think are biologically manipulated by the government and released to the population. Now, all of them, I, I don't know. I do know that it is likely that most autoimmune conditions, except for maybe cystic fibrosis, which does seem to be genetically, primarily genetically mm -hmm. based. Yeah. Most of them do seem to have some sort of microbiological component to them. Ulcerative pancreas and Crohn's disease seems, seems to be mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis in combination with candida or some sort of yeast as well. They, they co-infection together with one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, alkalizing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis seems to be Klebsiella pneumoniae. Mm -hmm. Staph, like I mentioned earlier, uh, se seems to be the cause of, uh, uh, with, with candida, seems to, both co-infection seems to be the cause of, of lupus, or at least worsens lupus. Um, MS, H. pylori, candida, like you mentioned earlier, or some type of herpes veridae reactivation, Alzheimer's disease. So much literature in the past 10 years that has caused by a, a, a genetic weakness to herpes simplex 1 being huh. able to infect the brain. Ton of research on that. Um, so much so that conventional medicine is actually looking to start using antivirals uh, to try to start trying to teach Alzheimer's, treat Alzheimer's disease in early studies in the next year or two. What do you think about the whole thing with Alzheimer's possibly also being like diabetes 3? Yes, but I think it's not the cause. I think it's a symptom. A symptom. The same with aluminum. The same with aluminum, uh, aluminum um, concentrating within the brain and the amyloid plaques and everything. Jason Hooper and I did an excellent podcast on Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to be that those are all symptoms, and it's the main cause does seem to be uh, herpes. Uh, herpes simplex 1 specifically. Uh, affecting the vagus nerve and eventually affect, just like a toxic plasmosis gondii, yeah. uh, which is which is a main known cause of schizophrenia, yeah. uh, especially in males, because women women um, have a genetic advantage because of, of estrogen produced to be uh, a kind of a little bit. Um, is that toxic strong... plasmosis? Is that toxic plasmosis thing the cat litter thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Not saying that women should change the cat box. You should just be on the safe side, but you do have a genetic advantage because of estrogen, to T. gondii, because for that, because if you did get T. gondii infection while you're pregnant, you could have spontaneous abortion. Right. Okay? So that's why men are more likely to have schizophrenia. And I've seen also, and I know it's a little bit controversial, but I'll, I'll say it. I've seen some studies also linking to, and Joe Rogan's talked about this ironically as well, that if a, a person, who has, like a male, if a male has very high testosterone and they get T. gondii infection, they become very aggressive, like majority of the Brazilian soccer team. However, <laughs> if a male has very low testosterone and ends up getting a T. gondii infection, it has been linked in some Indian studies to developing gender dysphoria. Oh, that's interesting. So I want to go there in just a little. I want to give you a chance to talk about the main crux of the things that you work on, which is the, the fixing your gut and the bacteria. I do want to go there with you about the gender dysphoria because you were the first person that I heard talk about it publicly and I had been thinking about it when, when you, know, you mentioned some stuff. And so I, I have some things I want to go there with that. But quickly back to the question I initially asked you, you are extremely bright and your mind works like something that is 
I mean, my mind is really fast and I'm like, wow, this guy's even quicker with, you know, he has more data to pull out of all these different places and your mind is fast like that. Like, this is the kind of stuff. I mean, you're the kind of kid with the kind of brain that they're looking at in programs. And this may be something in your lineage that has been either under study or under attack or both because it's a pain in the ass to people who don't want us to know anything. True. You know what I mean, you know, and, and, you know, mm, there's something um, I think of, so it's interesting you come from somewhat of a religious background that you have abandoned, but I actually think- No, that, no, 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 I am Christian. I have not abandoned it. I uh, actually renewed my faith probably in the past two years or so more yeah. than any period in my life. And I, we could talk about that, but yeah, I, 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 there were parts where I wandered in my faith some or were more Gnostic, but I've always been baseline Christian in my beliefs as far as my beliefs in Yeshua. But I think you, what I was listening to you talk about was that you don't go to church, you don't think you need No, to I don't believe in organized right? religion yeah, 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 like that. No, yeah. no, no, yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. But you were no. raised in that. And I think yes, I was. a lot of these um, ancient texts and religious documents and stuff like that, there's actually a lot of coded information in there about health, how to care for our body, yes. how it came to be what we are. It, it, the stories are metaphors for things that really have to, I got into a conversation with somebody at the conference I was just at about whether like the elements of the periodic table, like the gods are representations of those. Yes. Right. Okay. And the way that they interact with each other, which things should stay away from each other and, and whatever. Right. And we think of it as uh, gods at war, but it's really about the elements that are here for us to deal with. I think there's, a lot of information both in the Bible and the, in texts like the Bhagavad Gita, if you read between the lines, that are what I would call esoteric nutrition or esoteric, you know, wellness kinds of information. Yes. And you seem to be a person who can kind of unravel and understand and pull out all these kinds of strings, which makes you dangerous to a system on a number of levels. And that's just been kind of, as I looked into you and, and went over your stuff today, I'm like, this guy's, this guy's brilliant. You know, you look at things through, you know, you're very – you have a lot more scientific background and knowledge on this stuff than I do. I do a lot more. I, I mean, I know my. But stuff. you're able to intuitively pull it very well, and you're smart too, Emily. Don't doubt yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Though. No, no. But that's but that's what I'm saying is my mind reaches it with this intuitive stuff, and sometimes I'm saying things that like they almost sound so obvious they sound stupid, but nobody's thinking of them, right? right? Because we've all been like led into this thing where everything has to be complex and only the scientists can understand it and whatnot. When really it isn't. Like really everything is here right in our face. And it's yes. just like, I'm going to go, I mean, you're finding that as you do research, you're digging, but it's not that hard to find once you actually look, you know what I no. mean? You gotta dig. It's all right there. And it's not that hard to put it together. If you are not afraid to use your intuition and your imagination a little bit and also know things and you do that incredibly well. And so, you know, I'm not, I don't think, the, I don't think you need to have an answer as to what, as to uh, if anything happened to you with projects and programs, but I think, you know, it, it, you're, you're probably terrifying to the system. So that would be a good reason why. And it's interesting that it seems that it's not just you, everyone in your family seems to have had some sort of health issue. Yeah, very, yeah. very much so. And also, of course, yeah. I grew up, I grew up in Fort Bragg. You know, I live in Fayetteville. My family's been here since the Revolutionary War. My, my grandfather was uh -huh. the last person that was in the military. Um, and I will get back into my family heritage a little bit. I don't mind. I'm distant related to Marquise de Lafayette. That's the reason why we got the land here. My ancestor fought on behalf of on the German side, but he was French in the Revolu Revolutionary War. And Marquise de Lafayette gave him land here with his children moved to, he went back to France, and then he was beheaded during the French Revolution by the Jacobins. So you guys uh, have been driving them nuts for centuries. I guess so, yes. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I, you know, I, I, it's funny, I, I guess I come from a little bit of, of, of royal lineage, but I don't have anything to my name to show of it. So I guess right, we must but, have pissed off the elite sometime. During. But it's a lineage that seems to have been an irritant, right? Like yes, that one that's yeah. just all in on all the regular bullshit, right? So yes. it's yeah, so, I mean, that might be strong in your DNA, and that's, been, you know, been under attack for a long time. All right, let's get into a little bit, you mentioned H. chloride, which is really, like, at least from most of the things that I've listened to of yours, has been what your research and what your practice has kind of bloomed out of. Obviously, you get into a lot of other stuff. I've spoken at length on this show and others about candida, but mm -hmm. I haven't focused as much on bacteria, because I think 
you know, we all come at it from whatever our entrance point yes, is. Very much so. We focus on. And a lot of the people who deal with gut bacteria and stuff, I don't, I have issues with them because a lot of the things that I hear them recommending as solutions for things don't resonate with me on an intuitive level, but also are things that I know would cause yeast, fungus, and parasites. So why are we going to solve one problem and create another? When I listen to you talk about it, even though you were talking about something different, what you were recommending or prescribing to people as a solution to all kind of went in line with what I think is a healthy solution to anything going on in the system of the body. And so I was like, okay, this guy can talk to you about this. So why don't you tell people about what H. pylori is, what it did to you, and how your work on gut bacteria and healing your gut and therefore the whole system came about. Now I do also look at, I look at the whole microbiome as a whole, and the microbiome is made up of archaea, bacteria, yeast, parasites, viruses. I mean, they're all, it's all common. I mean, I had Tinea versicolor, which is Melezza furfur, uh, all, you know, a yeast infection all over my trunk and all over my arms. And it was causing a lot of issues with me being able to tolerate aldehydes, which, um, uh, um, you know, every time I, you know, drink alcohol, I flush, you know, very yeah. strongly. Um, so I had my own is yeast issues too. I don't discount. Disc oh, I didn't think you did. At all. No, no, I, um, I, didn't, I didn't think you did. I didn't think you did. But, you know, I just found that your stuff wasn't at odds in terms of the solution yeah. with what I, with what I kind of talk about. So tell us about H. pylori, because that's not something I've had any, any issues with, nor have I really dealt with very many clients who are coming because of that issue. So, so H. pylori um, is a gram negative a proteobacterium, um, which most of your proteobacteria, uh, the, the, the gram negative means it, it doesn't turn violet when you do a gram stave on it. Okay, gram positive bacteria remain violet. Gram negative bacteria don't turn violet. Okay, and so uh, their, their, their cell walls are different than gram positive in that you have a lipopolysaccharide around the gram negative bacteria, which is an endotoxin. Okay. And, and, and there are, you know, bacteria like um, uh, bacteroids, which they are gram negative, but just because bacteria is gram negative doesn't mean it's a bad guy, okay? And there's different levels too, you know, okay, so bacteroids are good. It makes up about 20 to 30% of your microbiome in a healthy person. It's one of the first bacteria you get exposed to as an infant, especially if you go through, uh, you know, your mother's vagina, uh, you know, so it, it's very important for your, for your health. Now, if you get an overgrowth of bacteroids, I've coached many people with that, it starts eating the lining of the intestinal tract, starts causing leaky gut, it could be a bad thing. But within reason, it's a good. Just because, you know, you hear gram-negative bacteria, that doesn't mean it's, there's many bad gram-positive bacteria as well, too. So, but it being a proteobacteria specifically within the phylum, proteobacteria have very nasty endotoxins. You know, E. coli, Yersinia, which is the cause of the Black Plague, uh, Legionella, uh, mm -hmm. Salmonella, you know, these are bacteria that cause serious, serious infections because of their endotoxins. It can cause quite a bit of damage within the body. So H. pylori, um, the stomach is supposed to be an acidic environment. It's, uh, you know, certain parts of your body that are supposed to be acidic and certain parts of your body that are supposed yeah. to be alkaline. And your stomach is supposed to be acidic, um, especially if, if for, for human beings, a lot of people, we have the digestive system uh, of, of an omnivore that almost borders a little bit more on meat consumption or protein consumption more than, it's definitely sugar. Sugar is not something that we should be ingesting in large amounts, if any at all. Nope. Um, and then we require our microbiome to actually digest a lot of the plant matter that we ingest. Um, unless you eat it raw, but they, it's a pet, like, Diet is so subjective. I guess I'm going on a tangent as far as that is concerned. As far as, but diet is so subjective in a lot of ways. But our stomach are supposed to be acidic. So if our stomach isn't acidic because we're under a lot of stress or because you're elderly in age or because you take a lot of antacids because you get a heartburn or you're taking medication that compressed stomach acid production, you can, if you swallow H. pylori, it doesn't die off because that's what, one of the main reasons why our stomach produces acid to have a low stomach pH it is so that, you know, the food that we ingest, it's going to have bacteria and microorganisms on it. Even if you burn your food, you know, in the oven, you know, it's still from putting it on the plate and utensil and you're shoving microbes down your throat on a constant basis. Okay. So that's, you know, your stomach acid, other than breaking down food and activating protease uh, in type enzymes, and activating uh, pepsin, it's there as a microbial defense, a frontline microbial defense on things that you ingest. And so when you have low amounts of stomach acid or a high stomach pH, 
bacteria like H. pylori can come in and they can proliferate and start reducing good bacteria that live in your stomach like lactobacillus and peptostreptococcus and start causing ulcers and, 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 and uh, bloating and heartburn and, and silent reflux and, and gastritis and all these conditions of the upper gut. It can also survive and proliferate in the duodenum, the liver, and the gallbladder. So it, and pancreas. So it is able to cause, it has been linked to diabetes, it's been linked to liver disease and fat malabsorption issues and fat digestion issues. It is able to live in that general area. And there are some studies that if it is able to escape into the bloodstream and start affecting the spinal cord, the vagus nerve, and or the brain, it has been linked to certain conditions like multiple sclerosis. So it's, it's, so it's very similar to the way yeast and fungus acts and that it's fine and balanced. And it yes. causes some of the same conditions as soon as it escapes where it's supposed to be and starts to get into the bloodstream and does the stuff with the gut, like does all the same similar kinds of stuff. It, 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 it is more of an issue based on acidity and pH rather than yeast and fungus, which is really about sugar, not that it, yep. it yeah. So, okay, so that, that's that's. Oh, no, hold on. H. pylori does feed off of sugar. It much does. like yeast, and it does feed off of protein too, like yeast can as well. Actually, for, for candida to go into its hyphal form, uh, starving it of sugar doesn't cause that, but if you completely cut off like all protein ingestion, if and you cut off sugar ingestion at the same time, it, candida will go nuts. Like if you go on a long-term water fast and some people with severe candida dysbiosis, it can mess them up. Yeah. Um, but but uh, so but yeah, it, it does. Fe unlike other bacteria where you get like a SIBO with Klebsiella or or or, or colonic dysbiosis. H. pylori loves sugar because it lives in the stomach. It doesn't have time yeah. to ferment and break down complex carbohydrates. Yeah. It wants that glucose wants fast. Yeah. I have a question. Has, yes. H, has H. pylori dysbi dys you know, bacterial dysbiosis like this increased as there seemingly became this obsession with alkalinity? Yes. That probably would be my guess of one reason yeah. why it has increased. I, I, I noticed, um, you know, I have a lot of... Uh, a lot of issues with trends that go on in dietary things, but there seems to be, I mean, we're supposed to have a combined, you know, a certain level or so to have some, like you said, some areas are acidic, some are basic and whatever, but people seem, it's actually okay for you to be a little bit acidic and people yes. are so obsessed with this idea of being alkaline. You know what I mean? They're eating all these foods to keep their alkaline, right? Okay. <laughs> you can't change the blood pH. It stands between 7.2 and 7.4 for a reason because yeah. if it went alkaline or slightly acidic based off of that, you will die. It's called metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalinosis. Yeah. So when you measure your pH strips of your urine for alkalinity, that's just how alkaline your urine is. And actually, alkaline urine, if it is if urine is too alkaline, that can lead to candida dysbiosis yeah. and bacterial dysbiosis of the urinary tract as well. That's been yeah. proven. Yeah. But, but I was just curious if that was, you know, I, I've noticed a lot of these issues. People have issues that they didn't used to have. And obviously, we eat like a degraded food. So we have a degraded food supply and lots of environmental issues that we don't have. But there's also like these cults around certain dietary obsessive yep. practices that I think are, you know, like there's the cult of kombucha, which I've also heard you <laughs> kind of say, I haven't heard you call it that. But um, I think a lot of these things that people think that they're doing that are helpful are actually, you know how people have like a gut issue? Like this is one of the things I noticed. They have a gut issue and they start to try and deal with it. But it just leads to another one and a bigger yep. one and another one and a bigger one because all the things that they're being told are solutions are actually increasing the problem and just creating another one and alkalinity, kombucha, all the fermented foods, all that kind Don't of stuff. Don't get me started, Emily. You know, okay. I'm going to start pounding <laughs> some probiotics. You know, I'm going to start taking them at random, just going like a roulette wheel. I'm going to take that one, that yeah. one, or I'm going to drastically change my diet, but not in a good way of maybe, you know, increasing, uh, you know, trying to increase cooked vegetable consumption or limiting sugar and healthy fat ingestion and, and, and meat ingestion and stuff like that. No, no, don't do any of that at all. No, no, no. Instead, I'm going to either become, go straight on the carnivore diet or I'm going to become, do straight veganism and not even proper veganism if you're really going to do it. No, yeah. instead, I'm just going to go to the extreme and that's going to end up messing me up forever. Yeah. Or I'm going to go on autoimmune AIP and limit my diet down to about 10 foods and not think right. that's going to have an effect on my health long term. Yeah, I, my my whole thing is if there's a whole food, a whole aisle dedicated to it at Whole Foods, you want to question whether it's uh, <laughs> whether you yeah. want to eat the kombucha and the fermented stuff. Okay, so 
you told us a little bit out about H. chloride, what it did. You said you had an issue with it that then led to you finding out you had all of these other issues. What did you do to sort of get your health back in order? And how did this lead to what you do with helping clients and, and writing your book and, and all this kind of the H. fluoride wasn't much later. It was not much later into my health journey that I figured out that's what it was. I thought some of my health issues, Emily, were because of the gastrointestinal surgeries that I had for so long. And I just had the, I had gotten better. I'd gotten better for years, but I still had silent reflux off and on. And I wasn't where I am now. I am about 90 to 95%. I feel the best I've ever felt my entire life right now. I ain't 100% there yet, but I'm working on it. What can um, you? What What is silent reflux in, in comparison to acid reflux? Uh, silent reflux has none of the typical symptoms of acid. Okay, so you have two sphincters. You have the lower esophageal sphincter that connects the esophagus to the first, to the beginning of the stomach, okay? And then you have the upper esophageal sphincter up here that, that, that opens and closes when you swallow, and it kind of helps glide the epiglottis so that it covers the larynx so you don't reflux into your larynx when okay. you're eating foods or when you cough or sneeze or anything. So silent reflux, the upper esophageal sphincter doesn't work. So when you're, when uh, it kind of, through gravity, because heartburn, the upper esophageal sphincter is working. So the reflux gets trapped, and that's why you feel the heat in your throat, and you're like, okay. oh, you know, and everything. But in silent reflux, it doesn't get trapped. So because of gravity, it shoots up, and then shoots down. So it's the aer aer aerosolized particles that start going up into your nose, start causing nasal issues, or your eyes, some oh. people cry pepsin, and and cry, uh, cry a stomach chime out of their eyes, or your station ah. tubes start getting inflamed, or you can't breathe, you have breathing issues for the, the aerosol particles of stomach chime going into your uh, lungs. So it doesn't cause like pain, like you think heartburn, you know, heartburn, right. get, it's why I call it silent, because it just shows, it mimics itself as post-nasal drip, or burning mouth syndrome, or clogged up ears, or breathing issues that aren't asthma. You know, it masks itself as all these other symptoms, but it's really just reflux. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So you were having all of that stuff go on and. I found out it was H. pylori. Jason Hooper, he always told me it was H. pylori, but I had two endoscopies, you know, two stool tests, one blood antigen test, and they all said they were negative. They all were negative. I'm like, there's no way I could have it. Well, I took a GI MAP test, and I and I had all and I was just, I had all the symptoms, and it came back with one of the positive antibodies for Siga A, and I and I and it, which can cause gastritis. So I was like, well, I've had all the symptoms, Emily, and I, so that's why I started doing strong research in H. pylori. You know, I started really digging into it. And I started realizing, oh, a lot of these tests, conventional medicine, they don't mean crap. Mm -hmm. You know, H. pylori is a transient nope. bacteria. They take a endoscope, they look at a certain area, they take a little biopsy. You might not be in that area. Might not be the area they biopsied. It could be somewhere else, you know. So, um, so I was like, you know, my I'll tackle it as H. pylori. Why not? Why I got to lose? But I did more than just take supplements. You know, I started taking D-limonene and, and I had zinc carnosine. I'd always been taking, and that kind of helped. That works against H. pylori. But I started doing other things too. I started really researching circadian rhythm and really starting to ground and activate my parasympathetic nervous system and get proper sunlight because my vitamin D had always been low even through supplementation and, you know, waking up at 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning and trying to go to bed. I'm staying up late tonight because I go to bed around 10 or 11, yeah. um, trying to do that and everything. And, and so doing that and just tackling everything all at once, that's what led me to overcoming my H. pylori. It wasn't just one single thing that I took that, that, that overcome it. It was, you know, trying to get my, my circadian rhythm is as good as it possibly could be and my, my sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system balanced as much as I can and, and try to get my gut microbiome. I started, you know, drinking cranberry juice who works very well against H. pylori and pomegranate juice and I started trying to rebuild my stomach uh, microbiome by taking very, very small amounts of sour cream because uh, lactococcus uh -huh. works very well. Uh, and I was able to tolerate that. Because uh, like I said, with, 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 with fermented foods and probiotics, it's subjective. And you have to be very careful when you're taking them because if you take them in the wrong way, you can end up worsening your symptoms. People with histamine issues do very, very poorly in fermented foods. You know, if you're yep. having hives and asthma and allergies, you don't want to reach for that no. kombucha because of alcohol and, you know, the yeast and everything like that, it's going to mess you up. But if you're someone with H. pylori and you're dealing with really bad liver issues or if you have a viral infection in the liver, the deglucurate from the kombucha, if you use the right type, I recommend uh, Brew Doctor's kombucha. 
that may be beneficial. It has its uses, but not for everybody. You know, you don't want, especially if you're having any type of yeast issues, any type of TH2 histamine issue, you don't want to touch kombucha with a 10 foot pole yeah. uh, because that will make you worse. When people tell, I mean, I've literally had people tell me that they're taking kombucha to deal with candida. And I was just like, oh yeah. But I mean, it, it, this is, this is where we're at with that stuff. I, you know, I, I know somebody who used to make their own kombucha like back in the sixties, right? And yeah. Kombucha. And they're like, this kombucha that people drink now is nothing. Like it used to be a very small amount you would take. Yes. A strong tasting thing. It wasn't something that tasted yummy and that you wanted to drink a lot of, or you know, it wasn't like grape cool eyed that with you know living bacteria. A ton it. of sugar. <laughs> you know, that's why the Dr. Brew, the Brew Dr. Tows, the Brew Dr. Kombucha, I recommend. It yeah. tastes like it tastes like piss. It's horrible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it smells horrible. It tastes horrible. You know, it has a little bit of ginger and turmeric with it, so it has a little bit of an okay taste from that. But it does not taste like a, some sugary, flowery drink. I mean, that's one of these fermented foods. They're not supposed to taste, you know, good. You know, they're, <laughs> they're supposed to taste bad because they're fermented. Yeah. And they have their own cases, you know. Not all of them work well, and some people should stay away from them, you know. And that, that's one of my biggest problems in alternative medicine as much as I am. I do appreciate alternative medicine. As we make everything else that's natural, like it does not have any drawbacks. There are many natural supplements yeah. and many natural recommendations that do have drawbacks for some people. Yeah, I know. I completely agree. Did you shift your diet a lot as well? Like you talked about some supplements and circadian rhythm and a few things that you were taking, but did you, I mean, remove sugar and gluten and all this kind of stuff or? Gluten I had already removed because I have celiac disease. So I, yeah. had, I, I was not eating that in the first place. Um, there were a few things. I reduced the amount of sugar I took in because it is my vice. I love chocolate. I, I do my best. To, I've gone down from 280 down to 170. I still got about 20 more pounds to lose. I'm working on it. But, you know, sugar is something. It is my only vice. I don't drink caffeine. I, I don't do any nicotine. I don't do any drugs at all except for the little bit of caffeine that's in dark chocolate, which is dark chocolate is more theobromine than it is yeah. caffeine. Um, but I, I, I pretty much just, just ate. I already ate clean. It, it didn't bother me. It didn't matter gotcha. with the fluoride because I was still feeding gotcha. it with protein. Yeah. So, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, I, there were a few things I knew upset my stomach. Like a lot of people don't know spinach. Spinach has an opioid peptide in it called rubiscolin 5. And some people with celiac disease who react negatively to opioid peptide gluten or people who act, react to casein, which is also an opioid peptide or, or uh, avenin and oats, which is also an opioid peptide or soy, soy morphin, which is in soy. Um, some people do react negatively to spinach because it does have robuscol, which is an opioid peptide, and it did for me. When I ate spinach, I didn't have the same ocular migraine that I would get with gluten, but I would get my stomach would burn, and I'd get that kind of opioid high from eating it. You know, kind of felt good eating the spinach from the opioid peptide. You know, kind of mm -hmm. the mood elevation from it. Um, but it's something that did not agree with me at all. And actually, I, I should write a or do a quick video on rubiscol and being in spinach because a lot of people know that spinach does contain that as an opioid peptide. Yeah, that that well, spinach has uh, for people. There's a lot of interesting little health issues that a lot of people have that are affected by spinach. It has issues to do with iron and thyroid and yep. different kinds of you know. So it can be one of those ones that people think they're doing something good for themselves when they're really at the, whatever supplement or medication they're taking. It's completely blocking the uptake of it. So yes, what's, what's the point? Um, have you read, um, I, I read an interesting book recently called The Ultimate Healing System by a guy named Donald Lepore, who was an early, an early alternative health person who was into muscle testing. And he taught, you know, for he's a little different than like the typical NRT or ULAN system kind of muscle testing or whatever. His system is a little different. Um, he's looking for metabolic antagonists and then balancing them with opposing things to overcome the allergy and things like that. But he talks about, one of the clues that you're allergic to something is if you're addicted to it. And just like yeah. what you were saying just now about the spinach, about the opioid high, right? If you absolutely um, abhor something or if you're overly addicted to it, you know what I mean? Then both things can mean allergy. And not that they can't be overcome, but that was interesting that you were talking about that sort of opioid it high. It can spinach. be, but it could also be a sign, for example, they say liquid zinc. If you're deficient in liquid zinc mm -hmm. and you drink it, it tastes like water. But yes. if you're if you have enough zinc, it tastes have a very strong metallic Metal. taste. Yeah, yeah. It. He talks about that too. Yeah. 
So, yeah. uh, you know, and also zinc should never be taken on an empty stomach unless it's zinc carnosine. That's something I want to make <laughs> anybody who's listening. Uh, if you take zinc on an empty stomach, you will have a bad day because it rapidly <laughs> bonds with stomach acid. You will be doubling over, throwing up, and puking your guts. So make sure you always take it with food unless it's zinc carnosine. The carnosine amino acid slows it down a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I would say, well, for the opioid peptides and for gluc- for sugar, which, again, Sugar yeah. increases dopamine, and, and even spicy foods, capsaicin increases dopamine too. I love spicy foods just like the next person, but it gives you that dopamine rush. Totally, I, mean, I, I love it. <laughs> so, so I mean, I so it, it, like capsaicin, capsaicin as a nightshade alkaloid, it can reduce inflammation through TRPV1, or for some people, it can cause inflammation because they cannot tolerate nightshade alkaloids. Yeah. So again, you know, it's uh, diet is so subjective, Emily. I mean, you know that too. It's, yeah, it's totally. hard to get up here to make recommendations to people. You make broad recommendations. A person that's histamine, yeah, maybe you should avoid high histamine foods like fish and avocados and dark chocolate and stuff like that. But yeah. I, it's, it, that's why I've never written a diet book and I never will because, you know. It's different, it, for, it's different for everybody. Yes. Like the only thing that I, you know, I mean, I have a certain kind of baseline thing I do with most clients, you know what I mean? And then I go off into you know, other, I clean them with something and then I go off into what's best for them. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. But, um, the only thing I can say is for everyone is remove sugar from your diet. I've never yes. met anybody who doesn't eat enough sugar and who needs more sugar. I haven't either. Right. And then, you know, obviously, you know, not too much with, um, you know, not overboard on, on grains and stuff like that. You know, that's kind of the only thing that you can say for everybody, you yes. know what I mean? Are those two things, everything else is, I mean, I'm also pretty, Although I will work with people who want to do it, I'm pretty opposed to vegan diets. Um, I will tell you that I am too, but I will yeah. work with people who want to do a vegan diet, but it has to be done correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And most people that I've worked with have started off vegan by the time I'm done working with them. They're not vegan anymore. I don't know if you've, if you've had that. But, um, but yeah, I have. I have because it's not, there's no, I will say this. There is no true carnivore society, just like there's no true vegan society either. Even the Inuits ate uh, uh, when, 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 when tubers were in season, mm-hmm. um, you know, so I, as much as Jordan Peterson is going around carnivore diet, this carnivore diet, that I'm not against per se eating vegetables when cooked specific vegetables. I think they have, I think plants do have p- potential, but I will say a person's diet should heavily be focused in more meat healthy fats, Me too. butter, extra virgin olive oil, avocados. I agree. I, the carnivore diet, I, I've talked to some people who've done it, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and when it, not, it seems like people can go on that for a little bit and it seems to help if they're having some kind of issue. Like I've talked to people, most people I know who've done it, done it successfully and not gone into some other weird situation, have done it for like three or four months and then gone back to, um, and then gone back to, you know, a more balanced diet that did include vegetables or whatnot. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think the extreme of either is good, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I don't either. All right. So we're going to kind of wind down the sort of health portion of this and move over into the patrons hour and talk about some of the some of the, the weird stuff. But before we go, to let people know how they can find your work and if they want to work with you, where they can find you. Yes. Um, you guys can find me um, at FixYourGut.com, uh, YouTube channel, Fix Your Gut. Uh, as well as the Fix Your Gut Facebook page. I um, also sell Fix Your Gut on Amazon. Uh, but yeah, definitely reach out to me if you have any health questions, if anybody has any health concerns. I've coached many people with more than just digestive issues uh, as well. I've coached people with Lyme disease, um, heart disease, liver disease. Um, I, my focus primarily is in digestion. That is where my knowledge is most broad, but I have coached many people with other conditions as well. And I definitely, you know, we Emily, we do think a lot alike. A lot of like, and it's, I will say this, there are very few natural health practitioners out there that think on the same wavelength that you and I do. Uh, Most of them are more, you know, let's try this fat diet or let's try, it's just, it's the whole complete package. It's more than just diet and exercise. It's diet, exercise, circadian rhythm, lifestyle, you know, epigenetics, the microbiome. It's more of all of this together that what makes us whole or what the Bible refers to as the body as a temple. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not just the column over here and the column over here, nope. you know, it, it's, it's the whole package, you know, and, and a lot of people, they, they want that pill. They're still in that mind. And I searched for that pill for years, even myself, before I realized it just wasn't there of the thing that would make me better. You know, it, it's more, you have to do all of these things 
and it's over a long period of time. You know, you're not going to, you know, change yourself the next day. It's doing the right things when you can't do them more often that ends up toward a more positive result. Absolutely. No, I agree with all that. And the other thing that I've added to what I do, even though in some ways it sounds kind of corny, but it's actually working better than when I was just doing more street nutrition stuff, is I've added an element of life coaching because yep. I find that people need, especially people in this alternative information community, which seems to be, you know, it's a lot of information that's hard to deal with, whether it's personal to you or not, it's dark information. And that yes. does take a toll on you. So finding something to do with all of the things that you know that, that is not harmful to you and finding a way of dealing with that. And then also like creating your own narrative for your own life and your own story, right? It's like having so that what you're doing makes sense to you on many different levels, not just on a survival level. And so I've added that to what I'm doing and I find that helps a lot too. So yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's, a, it's a many pronged tool that we're dealing with here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not easy, you know, trying to reverse the trauma that's been done to us all from an early age, from the beast system in and of itself. It's very difficult uh, to try to overcome, but it is something that hopefully most people are able to achieve. Um, and, yeah. and it is a whole approach, you know, though. It's more than, like you said, it's, I even left out even that part that you're thinking, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or EMDR. Or, or, I use EMDR, or, yeah. Or EMDR. Or, the thing with EMDR is you've got to be careful. You've got to make sure whoever's doing it, you trust them because it can be used to program to as well, similar to hypnosis therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the way that I bring EMDR in is by just encouraging people to do 30 to 45 minutes of right, left motion being walking every day to get their brain into that space that is, that's, I don't tell people to go to, I did have EMDR therapy. And when I had it, I recognized that, oh, yep. all these things that helped me are also the things I was programmed with. I get it. <laughs> so, the more things that people can be in control of themselves, that's kind of what I encourage so that they're not taking that risk. But yeah, I mean, if you're with a good practitioner, it can be helpful that way too. So very good. You think just like me, <laughs> we can be friends. <laughs> Grounding, trauma release exercise too as well. Those are all all things that people can people can learn those look them up and do those for free and, and you know the trauma release exercise as far as shaking to, to release epinephrine so we all have that innate response and grounding you can just put your bare feet outside on the ground you know hopefully if it's not sprayed with glyphosate you know hopefully right. it's, it's not <laughs> contaminated uh but yeah just doing those things all you know all those things a person can do to help re reactivate their parasympathetic nervous system and help reverse trauma absolutely all right that wraps it up for the first hour Meet us over on the patron side where we're going to talk about CNP, Finders Call, Mind Control, and whatever else comes up. We'll see you in a little bit. Thanks, guys. This is Off Planet Radio.